Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and a very warm welcome to the University of Winchester and to this inaugural lecture of Professor Neil McCaw. I'm Ms Stewart, I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University. It's a particular delight for me to be introducing Neil this evening because I've known and been friends with him for 18 years. We're all very proud of Neil here at Winchester because, of course, he's an internationally renowned scholar, but he's also homegrown. After a brief stint as a child in Scotland, Neil has spent most of his life in the south of England. His father, who's here tonight, was in the Navy, so there was some moving around as a child, but the family eventually settled in Portsmouth and then Fareham. At school, Neil is the first to admit that he was not the most diligent of pupils. His attitude was that life was there to be enjoyed and not taken too seriously. The vestiges of this attitude are still evident today. <laughs> At the time, this was seen by his teachers as an unfolding tale of underachievement and laziness that would ultimately mean, as one particular English teacher wasted no opportunity in pointing out to his mother at a parent's evening that Neil was not going to amount to anything much. <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> Neil left college and went straight into work as a training bank manager. At the time, he did not want to continue his education at university and was more interested in getting hold of some money. He soon realised how much he hated it and in every respect felt it was the wrong choice. Except that is for the fact that in spending two years doing something he disliked so much showed Neil that he should be utilising his brain more. By the end of that time he was desperate to do something else. And over this period Neil started working with young people, first as a play worker and then as a youth worker. And he loved it. He discovered he was pretty good at it. And he started to think he would like to become a teacher. At this time, Winchester, then of course King Alfred's College, offered a combined course in history and English. Neil's plan was to do that and then a PGCE afterwards to go into teaching. So he came to Winchester the first in his family to go to university, and he completely loved it. He very quickly realised that he was much brighter than he had ever been led to believe. Indeed, he graduated with a first-class honours and with an insatiable appetite to continue learning. He got awarded funded places to start postgraduate study at a few other universities, but at the very last minute, an opportunity came up here at Winchester for Neil to take up one of the first ever PhD scholarships we offered. And he stayed and did his PhD in George Eliot and Victorian culture and literature more broadly. <coughs> Even William, William, who's William? Even Neil's family is homegrown. He met his wife here at Winchester and his two sons were born shortly after he completed his PhD. So Neil came and he never left. He stayed here since teaching and becoming a leading expert on Sherlock Holmes. He's world renowned, filling lecture halls around the globe and working with the likes of TED Talks on a new educational video about Sherlock Holmes. Soon a new Sherlock Holmes exhibition he's developing should open with a view to touring the country and a new companion to the great detective 
featuring his work, will be hitting the bookshelves soon. We are incredibly proud to be here tonight to celebrate Neil's journey. A journey which over the years has had a few scary moments. But we have come to the moment where he has become the professor of Victorian literature and culture. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Neil McClure. And a special thank you to go, I don't know where he is, Johnny. Um, those of you that won't know who Johnny is, Johnny is it's his job to make these things work. And um, he's, he's been fabulous. Um, he's put up with my sort of deaverish requests, um, which I didn't think I was going to make, but as time went on, the request grew ever greater. And so the reason that my spring water is 10 degrees. And the reason I've got a bath full of blue M&Ms out the back <laughs> is because of Johnny. He was, he's been an absolute star. So, um, thank you very much. Um, people come to Sherlock Holmes in lots of different ways. Uh, if you read Stephen Fry's autobiography, uh, he talks of bunking off a of school and taking a train down from Norfolk so that he could attend meetings of the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. Uh, he, got, he got expelled. Um, and one of the leading world collectors of Sherlock Holmes memorabilia before he died, Richard Lansing Green, he began collecting Sherlock Holmes material when he was five. And he began uh, reconstructing Holmes's study in his family's attic at that point. And his mother drove him round Cheshire collecting things from uh, antique shops in order to make his own version of Sherlock Holmes. Um, real in his own family's house. I, I say these things because I have no such grand story of a lifelong devotion to Sherlock Holmes. My relationship with Sherlock Holmes is a bit of a shambles, if I'm honest, and, and contains lots of accidents. Um, I, when I was a teenager, I liked very much the Jeremy Brett at Granada adaptations. In a, in a kind of quite calm, relaxed way, I wasn't obsessive. But well, every generation has its own Sherlock Holmes actor in mind, and Brett was mine. But I didn't study Sherlock Holmes very much when I was a student, and my relationship with Sherlock Holmes almost sort of came out of nowhere. But one thing, when looking back, putting this together over the last few weeks, it struck me that uh, along the way, the, the, the global nature of Sherlock Holmes has been reminding itself to me all the way through and I just I wasn't noticing. So if you imagine, if you take, uh, two, it was about 2005, I was doing some work uh, for a friend of mine uh, for a local authority. It was, it was um, nothing to do with Sherlock Holmes at all. It was uh, some policy work around young people and young people's services. And we were doing some, some it was a little bit dull, um, but we were, we were doing some work, and at the time, that one of the leading world Sherlock Holmes collectors, a man called Richard Larson Green, died. He, it was terrible to, for, for my success to be on the back of that particular statement, but nevertheless, he died, um, and he bequeathed his collection of material to the city of Portsmouth. Those of you, some of you will know this, Arthur Conan Doyle was living in Southsea when he created Sherlock Holmes. So Lancel and Green had been down to Portsmouth and done some research and had a jolly time and liked the city. And when he died in his will, he'd left the collection. So my friend Steve, uh, Steve, he turns to me, we're in a room doing something else, entirely irrelevant Sherlock Holmes. And the words come that this, the collection's been left to the city of Portsmouth. And he turned to me and he said, you know a bit about this stuff, don't you? And I said, well, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I, at the time I had a PhD in Victorian literature, so I'd read a few novels, and he said, do you want to help us with this collection? Because no one knows what to do with it. So at that moment in time, the reason I was sovereign that I was involved in the collection was that I was the person who'd read most Victorian novels in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I 
So I said yeah because it seemed to me that this would be fairly jolly. We'd have a wardrobe full of material. It would take me a couple of weeks. And um, when the material arrived in four juggernauts, uh, 60,000 plus items of non-catalogued material that had been found in the back of sofas, in toilets, under carpets, it suddenly dawned on me that collecting Sherlock Holmes material, and Sherlock Holmes more widely, might be something that lots of people did and might have a, a global significance. As it turned out, Larson and Green spent his whole life collecting this material and going around the world. So, at that point, it suddenly strikes me that this is, a, this is something, this is a big deal. And I'd fallen completely by, not by any skill, other than the fact that I'd read a bit more uh, Charlotte Bronte than anyone else, I'd fallen into this project. So, for, for, fast forward a couple of years, and we'd been invited to go to Japan. The Japanese are really interested in Sherlock Holmes. They wanted to talk about an exhibition. So we go to Japan. I still have, it still hasn't quite dawned on me what I've, that I've bitten off way more than I can chew at this point. So we go to Japan, and, I, and the deal for me to go along is that I've got to give a talk. What can be more straightforward than that? So I agreed to give a talk. I, I wrote nothing. I had no notes. I thought, I, I think I may have thought, which I, for which I apologise, they're Japanese, they won't know really what I'm saying, it won't make any difference. So I turned up, uh, the day comes, they bus us to, uh, to the, what I thought was going to be a mini community centre. It's a big bloody auditorium of 200 plus seats. So I, I took a bit of a, I took a breath, I walk inside, there are three lovely young Japanese ladies standing there who are apparently my translators. They want, to, they want me to give their, my speech to them so they can translate it because they've got a packed house of 200 plus Japanese people who are coming to hear me speak. I, hadn't ha I didn't have a speech. So I spent the next two hours making one up <laughs> while they, look, they looked extraordinarily nervous and perturbed that this wasn't going to go well. I looked even more nervous as it happened. Um, just as we're about to start, this is, this is, it's gone into a virtual reality. Just before it starts, I'm taken outside of the room, that it's packed by this point, 200 plus Japanese people. There are uh, half a dozen journalists that are from all the main Tokyo newspapers. <laughs> they travel down on a train from Tokyo, which is four hours away from where this venue was, to listen to someone they've never heard of, but who is English, talk about Sherlock Holmes. At that point, I kind of tap myself on the head as if to say, oh bugger. <laughs> now I get it. If people are prepared to travel four hours on a train to listen to someone they've never heard of talk about Sherlock Holmes, it's not me they've come to listen to, it's the Sherlock Holmes thing. At that point, it suddenly became very clear to me that Sherlock Holmes as a phenomenon is global. It has more to it than you could possibly imagine. What I'm going to talk about tonight are some dimensions of that. I'm going to give you a kind of whistle-stop tour of Sherlock Holmes around the globe, and why I think, at least in part, some uh, people are interested in Sherlock Holmes. But I'm going to start with that rather too long anecdote, but I'm going to start with the fact that the, the talk as a whole has come from all of what I've just said, and these contradictions that were with me from early on when I was working with, on the Sherlock Holmes collection, things that I... I didn't understand at the beginning, and as time's gone on, I've sudden, I think I've worked out, partly at least, what's going on. So there are three contradictions or issues that the talk grows out of. The first is this. Many of you will know this, that if during the Second World War, there were a number of Sherlock Holmes films made featuring Basil Rathbone. Three of them in particular were what we might call, if we were being kind, mild allied propaganda films. <laughs> they are Sherlock Holmes and the Voice of Terror, Sherlock Holmes and the Secret Weapon, and Sherlock Holmes uh, go in Washington. Those are the three more explicit ones. The, the other films are still made in, in, across that same period, but these are the propaganda films. So Holmes is being used in the Second World War as um, a device to bolster national self-confidence, to, to, to make us feel better that we may have the Nazis on the doorstep, but we've got Sherlock Holmes on our side, it might be all right. <laughs> it's absolutely convincing. <laughs> at precisely the same time as this is happening, at precisely, there's no, it, chronologically, it's a perfect overlap. 
Sherlock Holmes is appearing in German language films. <laughs> it, it, this is a the film, The uh, Man Who Was Sherlock Holmes, is that one on the, on the left hand side. This is a German language version of Hand of the Baskervilles with Bruno Gertner. There's a play called Yo Pretorius that was very popular with the Nazis during the 1930s. So Holmes is, is appearing in Allied propaganda films at the same time as he's appearing in very popular German language films and plays. And these two films in particular were found after the Second World War in the Berghof, in the Eagle's Nest, Hitler's holiday home. He used to show these to his guests of an evening. They were two of his favourite films in the world. The Man of the Man Shark Holmes and this version of The Hound of the Baskervilles. So precisely at the same time as Holmes is making us all feel better because the Nazis are about to invade us, the Nazis are watching Sherlock Holmes films and loving it. How does that work? Second contradiction. There are a number of things that universally across the world we know about Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes wears an Inverness cape, he's got an Emersham pipe, he wears a deer stalker, he's got a housekeeper called Mrs. Hudson, he's got a best friend he lives with all the time, Dr. Watson, the baddie Moriarty, he's this ace character figure of deduction, he upholds the law, he's got a drug, a, a drug addiction, and the phrase, elementary, my dear Watson. We know these things everywhere around the world, these are the recognisable features of Sherlock Holmes. None of them feature in Arthur Conan Doyle's original stories in the same way that we know them. How does that work? Moriarty's in two stories, he's mentioned in one and he features in another. Mrs Hudson does almost nothing, she appears in 11 stories, mostly just being mentioned, Holmes doesn't use deduction in, in, in many of the stories at all. In fact, he guesses most of it. The Inverness cut, um, pipe, the Mish, uh, the Mish Elm pipe, the Deerstalker hat, they were creations of uh, Sidney Paget, who adapted the Sherlock Holmes stories for the Strand magazine. So, second contradiction. All these things we know about Sherlock Holmes, but we don't know why we know them. The third thing, the range of adaptation of Sherlock Holmes is extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. This is just a tiny, tiny, tiny fragment of the, of the adaptations. There's Muppet Sherlock Holmes, there's Star Trek Sherlock Holmes. There's terrible, cheesy films like Hercule and Sherlock. There's some really quality stuff, like the Watson and Holmes graphic um, comic. It's fabulous. There's some Daffy Duck nonsense. But, and also, uh, one of the interesting things, I can't say, I haven't got time, this is probably I can't speak for too long, and I haven't got time to talk about this. There is a really fascinating strand of black Sherlock Holmes. This isn't the Oscars, this is Sherlock Holmes, black and white. And not just recently with Watson and Holmes, this lovely chap on the right hand side is called Sam Robinson. He appeared in a film called Black Sherlock Holmes in 1916. The guy in the middle of it is called Burt Williams. He appeared in a film called Indahomey in 1903 as a black Sherlock Holmes. The diversity of, of adaptation is absolutely extraordinary. And this, this, I suppose whether you like this or not depends on your particular tastes. There is also a thriving subgenre of hardcore pornography <laughs> featuring Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> now, you will have to take my word for the fact. <laughs> that I found that by accident. <laughs> and to prove why, that I found it by accident, I'm going to tell you why, for how I found it. And I blame the Japanese. <laughs> this is why. This is a Japanese manga. There's a whole strand of Japanese cartoons. Manga cartoons. And I'm, re I'm really interested in them. There's loads of them. They're fabulous. And I was interested in particular in this one for a while. It's called Sherlock Bones. <laughs> Whatever you do, do not put the word Sherlock Bones into a Google search. <laughs> it's horrific. <laughs> In particular, don't put it into a Google search on the PC that the university has bought you from the research. <laughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> so the diversity of the Sherlock Holmes adaptations is, is just extraordinary. And again, how can the same character be manipulated and reworked and adapted in, in so many different ways? So those are the three strands that led to what I'm going to talk about now, which is that, after a while of thinking about it, it seems to me that 
the reason for those three things, the way, the way we can account for all those different elements, is that in different ways, Sherlock Holmes is a global superhero. He's used, utilised, represented, called for by people across the world as a superhero who can save them in whatever their circumstances might be. He has superhuman powers, he performs incredible feats of mental adroitness, he overcomes obstacles and obstructions, he wins great <coughs> victories against his adversaries, he restored order and ca where chaos once reigned, and he shows that seemingly insoluble problems are not beyond human reason. He is a global superstar and a global super, uh, superhero, and I'll hopefully in the next half an hour or so illustrate how and why. But it begins in the 19th century, because the Victorians, obviously, were the people who invented Sherlock Holmes, and they were the ones who first heroised him as well. What you'll find is, oh, I'll get to this, actually, I'll come to this part in a minute. Sherlock Holmes stories come to the end, uh, at the end of the 19th century. They're part of a tradition in detective fiction. Some people may know this, but Detective fiction as a genre, as a form, begins around about the 1840s with the stories of Edgar Allan Poe. And throughout the 19th century, different writers developed the style of the detective story in different ways. So you have Dickens writing in the 1850s, you have people like Wilkie Collins writing in the 1860s, people like Emil Gaborio into the 1860s and 70s. And the Sherlock Holmes stories appear in the 1880s. Part of what that's all about is about creating a, a reputation, an image, for the detective. At the beginning of the 19th century, particularly in the UK and in other Western countries, there, w there weren't police forces in the way that we understand them now. So police forces are developing across the 19th century, just as they're developing in fiction. And part of the job of fiction in this period of time is to create a myth or a mythology about superhero, about uh, detectives as superheroes. So 1829, Metropolitan Police Act creates the police in London. 1842, the creation of Scotland Yard. 1839, County Police, is, uh, police Force is created. 1877, the CID is created. These historical cultural changes are happening alongside fictional changes in the detective that are leading us towards the idea of the detective as someone who will save us someone who will clean up society, someone who will make things better for us. At the beginning of the 19th century, the reputation of the police was very poor indeed. There's a case in the 18, about 1817, 1818, where a policeman is uh, killed in the line of duty, and the jury bring in a, uh, a verdict of justifiable homicide. The argument they, they offered at the time was he shouldn't have been there in the first place. <laughs> Across the 19th century, that reputation changes, Till we get to a point in the late 19th century where Sherlock Holmes appears. At this point in time, people are more interested in crime and criminology than they've ever been interested in it. On the left hand side, you'll see examples of um, a finger marking system, an early form of fingerprinting created by Francis Galton. The Victorians are starting to think about what criminology means and how you might track crim uh, criminals down. On the right hand side is an example of what's called Bertillonage. A French, a French criminologist called Alphonse Bertillon created this body measuring system. They believed at the time that the shape of your body could reveal how likely you were to be a criminal or not. So there was such a thing as the criminal ear. <laughs> There's a criminal toe, apparently, a criminal jaw, and a criminal nose. The problem is that people started to get convicted for having the wrong ears and noses, <laughs> and they hadn't done anything. So, the Sherlock Holmes stories are tapping into this growing interest in detective and this growing interest in how we track down criminals and, and, and criminology more generally. That's why the early Sherlock Holmes stories have got forensic, uh, forensic evidence in them. Hoof prints, early versions of blood tests, early versions of fingerprints. So the Victorians are interested in crime, but they're starting to worry about crime as well. This is one of the reasons. The Jack the Ripper murders took place in 1888. The first Sherlock Holmes novel is 1887. The second one is 1890. 
So the first Sherlock Holmes publication straddled the, the Jack the Ripper murders, murders, as you know, that were never solved. There's a general anxiety or concern in the population about criminals, who they might be, where they might come from. Part of the anxiety of that is growing populations in cities like London. At the beginning of the 19th century, London had a population of less than a million. At the, at the beginning of the 20th century, a population of seven million. Massive immigration into, the, into urban centres, and that, a bit like, unfortunately, a bit like today, a paranoia that it's the foreigners that did it. So you've got people coming from all over the world into, into cities, and an anxiety that, what do we do about this, this criminal, uh, criminal behaviour? So one of the main suspects for Jack Ripper murders was someone called Leather Apron, who was suspected to be a Russian Jew. There was never any evidence, apart from the fact that he was Russian and Jewish, and that combination was fairly deadly at the time. And this fellow here, Adam Worth, was an Amer American criminal, a criminal mastermind, who cr uh, committed all kinds of criminal acts all over the UK and in Europe. His nickname was the Napoleon of Crime. Why is that relevant to Sherlock Holmes? It's because that's precisely the nickname Conan Doyle gave Moriarty. Moriarty is the Napoleon of crime. He was the real Napoleon of crime. So there's this sense of anxiety in the country about crime and what we might do about it. How do we manage these things? Is it out of control? Into that mix comes Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is there to save us. He's there to answer our prayers. He's there to deal with criminal behaviour. He's there to deal with criminals. There's a, a very strong sense of reassurance. The reality of the 19th century, I suppose it's like true of many cultures, is that crime hadn't gone up at all. The last decades of the 19th century, crime was fairly flat. It was an imagined, almost like a paranoia about crime and criminal behaviour, allied to this anxiety about foreigners coming from other places. Alongside this, one of the leading Victorian thinkers and philosophers of the time was a man called Thomas Carlyle, who wrote, who wrote many things. He was, he was extraordinarily eccentric, which is a euphemism. He um, wrote many, many things, but one of the things he wrote was a publication called On Heroes and Hero Worship, which is a study of what it means to be heroic in the 19th century. This is one of the, just one of the things Carlyle says. Men who are credited with powers so lofty and far-reaching naturally hold the highest place in the land. They are supreme in civil as well as religious matters. In a word, they are kings as well as gods. These are the, the, the Victorian heroes, the idea of the great man who will save us, who will be there for us, who will unravel the mysteries of the world. This is part of the explanation as to why the Victorians were so fascinated with Sherlock Holmes, that lone figure who has capacities and abilities that no one else has, who can solve problems that none of, no one else can solve. It led to many things. Uh, a wide fascination with Sherlock Holmes. When Conan Doyle killed Sherlock Holmes off in 1893, he received all kinds of what you call now hate mail. One of the letters begins, you brute, which is a Victorian insult. It's, we'd, be, we'd be much more offensive these days. All kinds of um, letters written to him complaining that he killed Sherlock Holmes off. The story goes that his mother didn't speak to him for about six months. Um, there's, there are rumours, though admittedly no historical evidence, that people wore uh, bands of mourning as they walked around London, so, so sad they were about the death of Sherlock Holmes. But the other thing that starts to happen at the time, which illustrates quite how powerful Holmes was as this saviour figure, is people start writing to him, because he's real. So they write to Sherlock Holmes to ask him to solve problems and to get them out of a mess. And one of them, there's a, there's a letter where someone asks him to find their cat, uh, which he obviously didn't do. But there are many other letters that ask for more dramatic things. I picked a couple that I thought were interesting and revealed quite how embedded that idea of Sherlock Holmes is. This is one from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I'm writing to you, dear Mr. Holmes, I'm writing to you in the hope that you can locate a certain actor, Basil Rathbone. Since he is of English birth, I thought you might be interested in the case. I'm trying to locate him because of the excellent job he did in portraying you in several motion pictures. Also, say hello to your housekeeper, Mrs. Hudson. Your brother, Mycroft, Inspector Lestrade, and of course, good old Watson. Oh yes, and Moriarty too. 
if you should happen to run over him. <laughs> and this one was, is from Germany, which I think it's sinister, I'm not quite sure, but it does sort of reveal the depths that people will go, go to in their devotion to Holmes. This is, um, Dear sir, being an enthusiastic reader of your adventures, I would beg you for an answer. How much is love the root of crime? Is it really possible to become a criminal because of love? That's it. That's the yes. <laughs> Goodness knows what happened afterwards, but it, I, I suspect it wasn't good for whoever it was that, that, that chap loves. But before, before we get slightly carried away about these deluded Victorians and their hero worship for Sherlock Holmes, I just wanted to show you something which is more of a, a, a sort of sobering riposte to that. This is an article from The Telegraph. Um, why, Winston Churchill didn't really exist, say teens. It's a survey of um, young people and who they think was real and, or not. More people thought Sherlock Holmes was real than thought that Winston Churchill was real. By many percent points. <laughs> so it's not just the Victorians. We are equally foolish in our, in our uh, understanding of the reality of certain things. And young people are very convinced that Sherlock Holmes is a real character. So, moving on. So the Victorians have created this idea of Sherlock Holmes to save us. He's the saviour. He's going to deal with criminal behaviour. He's going to deal with cats and trees. He's going to solve love problems. He's going to do all of those things. Move things on. The, there's also lots of evidence of the way in which Sherlock Holmes is used within times of war. And I've picked examples from the First World War and the Second World War. This is a, a, an excerpt from the Wipers Times. I'm sure many of you will know this. The Wipers Times was a magazine published by the soldiers in the trenches during the First World War. While the shells were raining down, while people were dying all around them, they were printing out the Wipers Times, their own version. It was an ironic play. It was uh, on Ypres, which is in France, and they reworked it as the Wipers Times. This is the first edition in 1916. Right up front, our new serial, Herlock Sholmes, at it again. The, the adventures of Herlock Sholmes run through the Wipers' times. Soldiers, who you would think, were at their lowest possible ebb, looking for, I don't know, entertainment, solace, whatever it might be, are creating their own versions of pastiche Sherlock Holmes stories. And it's not the only example. There's a, a British prisoner of war magazine called Q that features the adventures of Barlock Jones. They were, they were worried about getting sued by Conan Doyle at the time. <laughs> he wasn't dead. And he was quite keen that people paid him for licensing for the Sherlock Holmes stories. So they had to come up with something really original, like Barlock Jones. Um, in, the, in the Scarlet Drop regimental magazine, it's the stories of Spitlock Pones. <laughs> uh, as you can imagine, but the, in the end, they run out of the puns. But the First World War, there are a number of interesting examples of where Holmes becomes a, a, a figure. The Sultan of Turkey, there, are, there, are, there is evidence of examples of letters written by the Sultan of Turkey who was worried that Sherlock Holmes was, work, was working in Asia Minor during the, second, the First World War. He was asking people where Holmes was <laughs> and if he was going to do them any particular damage. He was a, a, a big fan of Sherlock Holmes, that happens. But he was quite obsessed about that. There's um, another example where, um, during the First World War, Conan Doyle was well connected. He went in the trenches, because he was writing a history of, of the Great War. And when he was in one of the French trenches, one of the French generals asked him where Holmes was based for the war, where, where he was fighting from. So people are getting caught up in this idea that Holmes is really there and really participating as part of the First World War. The examples in relation to the Second World War are obviously more pronounced. And I'm going to show you some clips, some short clips, from the Rathbone films. So, uh, Secret, Boys and Terror, Secret Weapon in Washington. The first part of the clip is from the beginning of the film, The Voice of Terror. And the reason I'm showing you is because it, come, it creates that sense of quite how in peril everybody felt, and therefore in need of this heroic figure who's going to come and save them. So this first clip is from Sherlock Holmes and the Voice of Terror. Germany 
Broadcasting, Germany Broadcasting, people of Britain, greetings from the Third Reich. This is the voice you have learned to fear. This is the voice of terror. Again, we bring you disaster, crushing, humiliating disaster. It is funny to stand against the mighty wrath of the Fuhrer. Do you need more testimony of his invincible might to bring you to your knees? Very well. Are you ready, operative number seven? This is the voice of terror. A secret airplane factory somewhere in England. Listen, the screams of the dying can still be heard. This is the voice of terror. Are you there, people of Britain, shivering in your cellars? Listen, Operative 41, the fuse is lighted. Oil to fuel your navy, to feed your tanks. There it goes up in smoke by the millions of gallons. This is the voice of terror. Do you still believe that there are secrets unknown to the Fuhrer? Listen. Tonight at 7.10, an important diplomat boarded a train at a little station outside Liverpool. Each split second is accounted for. The rails divide. The train hurtles through the air. The diplomat will make no report in London. This is the voice of terror. Englishman, do you still await your doom in your stupid, stuffy little clubs? It will come, I promise you. Operative 23, the time is now. We strike you on the high seas, as well as on the land. This is the voice of terror. Englishman, the Fuhrer strikes you now as he pleases. Water pours through your greatest dam, smashing everything before it, even as our invincible armies roll toward their objectives. OK, so that's 1942. You can imagine that being bloody terrifying, actually. This idea of the voice of terror, of Germans everywhere, of taking over. But then you, the riposte to that is the endings of these two, the next two films, which is The Secret Weapon and In Washington, in which, in both cases, Holmes plays this reassuring, heroic figure, pulling everyone together, reassuring everybody in time of need. Both of them do something very similar, but in slightly different ways. Things are looking up, Holmes. This little island's still on the map. Yes. This fortress, built by nature for herself. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. Well, it'll be nice to get home to Baker Street, eh, Holmes? Yes. But this is a great country, Watson. It certainly is, my dear fellow. Look, up there ahead. The capital. The very heart of this democracy. Democracy? The only hope for the future, I hope. It's not given to us to peer into the mysteries of the future. But in the days to come, the British and American people will, for their own safety and for the good of all, walk together in majesty and justice and in peace. That's magnificent. I quite agree with you. Not with me. Mr. Winston Churchill. I was quoting from the speech he made not so long ago. And then very booming. Okay, so who isn't reassured by that? <laughs> Everything's fine now. We're all, we're all relaxed about it. So this idea of Holmes as the saviour, as someone who's going to rescue us, who's going to deal with all the problems we have to deal with, not just Victorian crime, but now global war, is much more common and developed in Western cultures, in, U in the UK in particular, but also in, uh, in the US. One of the things that I thought was it, what I found was interesting was the fact that you, you see something similar in other cultures too. You see something in Russia, for example, and this is um, this a poster of a Buster Keaton, a, a Russian reworking of a Buster Keaton film. Um, but what you see, what, looking into it, Russia was adapting Sherlock Holmes stories from very early on. So we, there's, there's examples of Russian ad adaptations right at the beginning of the 19th century, and a couple in the late 19th century. During the Second World War, the Russian troops chose Sherlock Holmes stories as part of their library, the library of, tech, uh, of the text that they could read. The most famous, the most well-known Russian adaptation of Sherlock Holmes is uh, a series made during the Soviet period, between 1979 and 1986, 
featuring a, a, a guy called Vasily Levanov, who has become quite famous. I'll say something more about him in a minute. But one of the interesting things with, about the Russian adaptations is how they use lots of British, lots of American influences in creating their own version, slightly off beat, I have to say, but their own version of the Holmes as the hero. This is a trailer for the series featuring Vasily Levanov. Come on, it's not. Lots of different interesting things you could say about this, but the fact is it might appear to us a little on the clunky side, but these were made between 1979 and 1986 in the, in the Soviet Union. They were extraordinarily popular. Livanov got an honorary MBE from the Queen for his services to acting, and in particular for being the, the best ever foreign language Sherlock Holmes. Outside the British Embassy in Moscow, is a statue of Livanov as Holmes, as an indication of quite how much the Russians took him to their heart. And continuing with our theme of, uh, of heroism, I just want, I'll read a quote from Livanov he wrote in the 1980s and explaining why he thought these, this series was so popular. He said, Holmes's popularity can be explained by a characteristic that ensures eternal appeal. It's a readiness to help people. People need help. Now, in our alarming times, people are particularly in need of help. People are not reliable. There's no faith that someone in the world will help you out. That's the essence of it. And he said that in the, about 1985, right in the middle of the, the, I suppose, the tail end of the Soviet Union. The Russian people loved that series, it was extraordinarily popular, so much so that it then, got, it then led into these other versions of Sherlock Holmes that are Russian language versions. That on the left, top left hand side is a children's ballet called Sherlock, uh, I'm not sure how that, that works, but a children's ballet called Sherlock Holmes. There's the Levanov in the middle. On the left hand side is a, a cartoon called Sherlock and I in which Watson is the great dame uh, who can talk. He's very useful. Um, but he's the dog, which is, which is lovely. There's a, a, a 2013 series called The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes on the top right-hand side, very influenced by the Guy Ritchie films. It's sort of an action-packed Sherlock Holmes. He runs around punching people in the face and throwing people out of windows, that kind of thing. And this is the musical version of Sherlock Holmes in which, which I suppose makes that point about, about diversity, Holmes is a woman. So we've got, we've got a, a, a singing and dancing in Tartan version of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> so the Russians are, are extraordinarily taken with Holmes in, the, in that heroic sense. This is someone who, 
who can help them, who can save them, who can deal with their problems. The director of the series is a guy called Igor Maslenikov, and he said this about the series. Anyone who goes to Holmes feels secure. He is reliable. And this has got a, quite a significance, bearing in mind he's writing under the Soviet Union. Whereas the police are there to punish you, Holmes wants to help the victims. He is the personification of gentlemanly behaviour. Audiences are always in need of someone with those qualities. So just as, if you think of parallel, just as the Victorians in their own way and the British and the Americans if during war are looking at Holmes in, a, in, a, in that way as someone who can deal with problems, who can sort things out, who can help them, who can save them. You've got people in Russia doing something very similar. It seems, it seems extraordinary that he's tra Holmes is translating across the world in that way. But it's not just Russia. But this is a clip. This, um, uh, it's a cartoon, Russian cartoon. The reason I'm showing you is because it's insane. And I love it. And if I could show you all of it, you would see quite how heroic Holmes is in this cartoon. But you've got to see it. It's called Sherlock Holmes and the Little Black Men. And this is just a little clip from the beginning, which will give you an idea of quite how insane it is. Oh. YouTube if you want it. There's, a, there's six episodes. He's fabulous. And he's a, a properly badass, heroic Watson at uh, home. And particularly because he's a cartoon, you can do absolutely anything you want. So, um, so that's Russia. I'll say a little bit about, there's so much more I could say about the USA and their relationship and its relationship with Sherlock Holmes, but I haven't got time. But I think one of the things that I would like to say is that, the, again, the range of Holmeses that come out of America are extraordinary. From uh, that's the pink, that's uh, Sherlock Pink, which is a, a, a fabulous cartoon. Ep the episode of uh, Star Trek. This guy on the left hand side is Ferris Hartman. He's the first American ever to play Sherlock Holmes in 1899, and this is obviously a derivative of Sherlock Holmes in the house. The um, although Hartman is known as the very first Sherlock Holmes, <coughs> um, or, or we now know as the first Sherlock Holmes. This man here, uh, William Gillette, is regarded widely as the first American Sherlock Holmes until we found out about Hartman. And he, this is um, a film of him playing Holmes. I don't know if you can recognise on the left-hand side who that might be. Uh, Charlie Chaplin with Billy in the film. They found the print of this um, in France recently. It, it, it was thought to be lost, but they've done a sort of renovating job. Um, anyway, the... Gillette made a career of being Sherlock Holmes. He went around the world, he made over 1,300 performances of a play that he'd written. He bought the rights from Conan Doyle, wrote the play, and then performed it all over the world. It was the thing that made him. He was known as Mr. Sherlock Holmes. He made an absolute fortune, became a millionaire as a result. So he's the early silent version of Sherlock Holmes that we know most about. We're starting to find 
out lots more information about early silent versions of Sherlock Holmes, including those um, African American versions that I mentioned earlier on, like Sam Robinson. There's a the film Black Sherlock Holmes is in the Library of Congress, but they're the only people who seem to have a copy of it at the moment. Um, the other reason that America has got a particular relationship with Sherlock Holmes is because it was in America that the, Sher the very first Sherlock Holmes Society was formed. The Baker Street Irregulars were created in 1934 by a man called Christopher Morley. Now there are hundreds of Sherlock Holmes Societies all around the world, but the Baker Street Irregulars was the first. And as if, if uh, you doubted that, the, that people took these uh, societies seriously, uh, Eisenhower and Franklin Delano Roosevelt were both members of the Baker Street Irregulars. We've got the letters where Roosevelt accepts membership when he should have been doing other things <laughs> during the Second World War. He's in fact, uh, and, and, and in a very bizarre way, so this is, this is one of the letters, there, he went on a bit about it, I have to say. So he says, I'm glad to have part of any movement whose purpose is to keep green the memory of Sherlock Holmes. Now that I belong to the Baker Street Irregulars, I cannot restrain the impulse to tell you that since I had to give up cruising on the Potomac, I sometimes go off, on the, off the record on Sundays to an undisclosed retreat. In that spot, the group of little cabins which sheltered Secret Service men is known as Baker Street. So the President of the United States is now a member of the Baker Street Irregulars, and he's fictionalising places that he owns or, or, or governs as elements of the, Baker, of the Holmes story. It goes on, this is even weirder. He's, Roosevelt says, at an early age, he, uh, Holmes felt the need to do something for mankind. He was too well known in the top circles in this country, i.e. America, and therefore chose to operate in England. His attributes were primarily American, not English. Actually, and this is the President of the United States saying this, he was born in America. <laughs> So apparently Sherlock Holmes is, is absolutely American because of his own his, his heroic qualities that he, he he played down and he went over to cruddy England so he could just do his stuff there because he's really an American underneath. The one of the leading world collectors of uh, Holmes material, in addition to Richard Lightson Green, who I mentioned earlier, was a guy called John ben, uh, John Bennett Shaw, and he captures I think quite neatly the American or an American perspective on Holmes in light of this issue about heroism. And Bennett Shaw said this, before, this is before he died in the late 20th century. We the Americans need Sherlock Holmes more than the British, I think. He's a leader. And this is very important in this country where we have no leaders. Our political people are programmed by advertising agencies. We need Sherlock Holmes. So that's a, that's a, a I guess of reinforcing that sense that Holmes is offering something that <coughs> most of us don't have, something that's missing, something that can put us all together again, that can heal society and can deal with political problems. You can see that strand from uh, England, from the UK, we can see that into Russia, we can see it in the United States, and we can also see it in my final two examples, in both uh, China and Japan. This is, uh, this is a fabulous story. So this is about China and Sherlock Holmes. I mean, this isn't, it may look like Sherlock, as we know it, but it's not. It's curly foo and peanut. And the reason it's curly foo and peanut is because that's what the Chinese call it. Because the words for Sherlock Holmes and Watson sound like curly foo and peanut. So the series has become known as curly foo and peanut. True. Fifteen million people subscribe to this series every t every episode in China. They're, they've got their own sort of version of YouTube that you have to subscribe to that enables you to watch all the episodes, and they watch them the day that they broadcast in the UK as well. So they, they're, if you go on uh, on the internet and put in curly foo and peanut, you'll find all these fan sites of Chinese people obsessing about Benedict and the intricacies of the BBC Sherlock series. But it didn't start with these. There are Chinese translations of the Sherlock Holmes stories right at the end of the 19th century, now, not long after the, um, Conan Doyle was writing them. The first complete uh, translation into classical Chinese it was, was completed in 1916. The first Chinese film of Sherlock Holmes was 1931. So China's got this tradition of being interested in um, 
in Sherlock Holmes and his qualities. He even survived the Mao Revolution. He, he, what, this an interesting thing goes on where China reinterprets Sherlock Holmes, um, where uh, he's, he's seen as um, a, a campaigner against capitalism. I don't know how they got that, but that's what they got. Um, someone who is fighting for the common good. So they rework Sherlock Holmes as a version of a communist hero. Even Mao himself, it gets more bizarre the more you look into this. Chairman Mao was a Sherlockian. He liked Sherlock Holmes very much. And he had this, head, one of the heads of his secret service was a guy called Bo Lu. Bo Lu, <coughs> he called the Sherlock Holmes of Yunnan. Yunnan was a place where he was based and where he was working. Chairman Mao calls this guy the Sherlock Holmes of Yunnan. It gets more and more bizarre the more you think about it. The clip I'm going to show you is from a Chinese television program called Young Sherlock, which illustrates absolutely how in China, and as I'll show you in a minute, in Japan, they've really <coughs> ramped up this whole idea of Holmes as the hero, because in Young Sherlock, he's a proper hero, just as he is in some of the, the uh, Japanese examples. This is Young Sherlock. <laughs> So, many of the elements of the traditional Victorian version in terms of deduction, reading clues, judging crime scenes, but with an additional element of a, an entirely different culture, an entirely different set of assumptions. And there are many things, there, there are some overlaps with a clip I'll show you in a minute, which is a Japanese uh, puppet cartoon of Sherlock Holmes. But the thing to say about Japan is that, the Japan, uh, as I said earlier on, the Japanese love Sherlock Holmes. Uh, this is a, 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 a Sherlock Holmes statue in Kirizawa. This is a, um, the Sherlock Holmes 221B recreation in, uh, in Kobe, which is in um, Kyoto Prefecture. And you can, go, <laughs> you can go there and dress up as your uh, you rather. It's a, it's a slightly odd experience. I've been there. And it's, a, it's, rather, it's odd to dress up as Sherlock Holmes in, the, in Kobe with some enthusiastic Japanese people liking very much the fact that, well, I'm not really quite sure that you're so enthusiastic or you're enth as enthusiastic as they are. But Japan's got a long history of being interested in Sherlock Holmes. Again, translations from the late 19th century into the, uh, into the 20th century. The Japan Sherlock Holmes Club, which is their main uh, Sherlock Holmes Appreciation Society, has got hundreds of members and a thriving website. They're very enthusiastic about the whole thing. Where Sherlock Holmes seems to be going more in Japan is in uh, manga cartoons and in uh, uh, these sort of cartoons. We've got, on the left hand side, it's called Detective Conan, um, which is a combination of Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes. And the Black Butler, we've got uh, Sherlock Hound, which isn't a very good pun, it doesn't really work in Japanese or English, but nevertheless. And that's Dear Holmes. Um, and Sherlock Ninja, which is my personal favourite. You, um, you can access these online. They're fabulously well drawn. They up, they, uh, it, I've got no idea what's happening in any of them, but it looks bloody brilliant and really exciting. So, they, so they, they, that sense of Sherlock as a, as a modern day hero for younger audiences in particular is thriving in Japanese culture. These are not old magazines that have died out. Sure, uh, Detective Conan is a, is a TV series as well. It's a cartoon series. You can, if you would like to go on Amazon, you can buy the videos and be completely flummoxed as to what the hell's going on all the way through. But, the, but there, there's a, 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 a real sense of the, the heroic elements of Sherlock Holmes becoming the, the only elements. Many of the other, the original Victorian or 19th century crime-fighting elements are downplayed, and what we're getting are these sort of action hero figures. Sherlock Ninja is extraordinary. He can do pretty much anything you can possibly imagine, partly because he's a cartoon character, so that's all. I suppose that comes with the territory. In 1999, the Sherlock Holmes stories were voted in Japan as the best stories in the world. So that's, that's significant. Um, and Sherlock Holmes was voted the most famous, well, this is, you've, got to, you've got to do a double take on this one. Sherlock Holmes is the most famous English person ever. <laughs> uh, second, <laughs> second came the Beatles. Third was Princess Diana. 
per figure. But Sherlock Holmes is definitely the most famous English person ever. And, and the, the last clip I'll show you, this is from a, a, a cartoon called Sherlock Gakuan, which is a puppet cartoon series. And this is all out heroism. It's pretty much stripped back any other features. Sherlock Holmes is the best hero you could possibly want or indeed imagine. It's, it's, it's so charming and beautiful as well. There's material from Australia, there's material from South America that is similar in the way that it takes Sherlock Holmes and slightly tweaks and reworks him for that different culture, but is still that same hero, still that same character saving us, dealing, dealing with our problems. Holmes is, in all of these instances, someone with extraordinary heroic attributes, someone who is benevolent, who, who, who does good for people, who doesn't have to but chooses to. Someone who has got these wonderful powers, in his case, that his mental powers, but in some of these examples, also physical powers and physical prowess. He's got his own supervillain. Moriarty is the, is the epitome of a supervillain who works off of Stan Lee, who's the creator of uh, Spider-Man and many other superhero characters. Always says, one way you know you've got a, a superhero is if you've got a supervillain as the counterpoint. Sherlock Holmes lives in a world that, at least to many audiences or viewers, feels real. It feels like he's participating and joining in. And as such, he's a superhero in all of those ways. Even with the BBC series, which does something slightly different, it, part of what it's doing is thinking, is getting us to ask, what is a hero and, and, and what is heroism? Holmes says in the BBC series, I am not a hero, I am a high-functioning sociopath. And it's our job to work out what the difference is, and if there is any difference at all. So, Holmes is the first of these superheroes. He's the first because he came at a time when global culture was first developing. It wasn't possible, really, to be a hero across the world when you, until you had mass media that was transcending different countries. So he's, it, the timeliness of his arrival means that he's global in a way that other characters haven't been. And in almost every culture and every continent you can think of, there is a version of Sherlock Holmes. The only continent I can't find anything is Antarctica. <laughs> All of the others have got their own version of Sherlock Holmes. There are nearly a thousand Sherlock Holmes societies in almost every country around the world. People enthusiastically talking about the stories and talking about Sherlock Holmes in all of those different ways. Um, Henry Rollin, who's a famous forensic uh, psychologist said this about Sherlock Holmes. We all need to identify with someone who is omnipotent. Conan Doyle created Holmes as a man of superior intelligence who was capable of working and working and working and bringing all of his endeavors to a satisfactory conclusion. He's a that sort of superhero figure for all ages. And if you needed any more evidence about that sense of heroism that we associate with Sherlock Holmes, um, the UK Police Force has got a database that it uses when it's managing all the most serious crimes that take place around the country. It manages the information around scenes of crime, about suspects, 
all the key information that you need if you're solving a particular, particularly heinous crime. And it's called the Home Office Large Major Inquiry System. <laughs> and <coughs> that's the software. So at that moment when the police force of, the, of an entire nation are thinking of the thing that they most want to capture that infallible sense of collecting information, solving crimes, helping people out, sorting out the world, they created homes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you will recognise that Neil is Professor of Victorian Literature and Culture, and we can see how the combination tonight between something that was written with a, a pen and a pot of ink and a piece of paper has magically transmogrified into this huge uh, cultural institution idea. And it will also continue because as we come through the 20th century into the 21st century, we will have our own. Uh, homes and long after we're gone there will be uh, more to come as well. Thank you very much Neil for uh, even just giving us a snapshot of this. I first met Neil 20 years ago when I came to the university and he was writing his PhD at the time and I did a visiting job to the University of Southern California which we had a, an exchange with at the time and I got off the plane and, and in, in Los Angeles and you get off the plane and, and I got this taxi which was um, it, the taxi was, it was like a small minibus, it picked up lots of people. And some people who got off the plane with me as well uh, had been in London. A young man and his, and his mother had been in London. We were waiting for this taxi who was going to drop us off in various parts of Los Angeles. And uh, we were sitting in the, on this taxi um, 20 years ago. And they said they'd been to London, they'd seen Big Ben, the Houses of Parliament, Buckingham Palace, all the kind of tourist stuff and Baker Street. And it's extraordinary, you know, how was I to know? 20 years later that, that it would come round a full circle. But the curious thing that I, I just remember during the talk was his mother said, we need a home to clean up this city. And this was Los Angeles, just outside LAX, yeah. Okay. Um, once again, that kind of abiding uh, story that we all have this uh, idea of the, the way that Holmes has kind of filtered into our, our cultural consciousness. Um, thank you, Neil, for the talk. But I also, I'd like to thank you because for those who don't work in a university system and don't work with the university, don't really know that being a professor, becoming a professor of something uh, like Victorian culture and Victorian literature is just a small part of something that happens when you work in such an institution. Because Neil has given 20 years to this institution so far, and he's still a young man. So we've got more, he's only on the first kind of steps of his professorial uh, ladder. Um, but in those 20 years, I've watched them for 20 years, I've worked with them for 20 years. We've had, mostly at 6.30, 6 in the morning, we exchange emails and have a laugh in the morning, in Sunday mornings, we would chat to each other and have a bit of a joke. Um, because he's been a huge asset to uh, us, and uh, when I say us, I mean the, uh, the creative writing program. People here won't really know that Neil um, picked up the creative, program, the creative writing undergraduate program and turned it into the number one national the, the number one creative writing program in the National Student Survey in the country. Number one, that's like top of the box. That, it doesn't get any better than that. And that happened not just one year, but a couple of years under Neil's governance in which he's now moved on. So the creative writing program, but the English and creative writing program, the Department of English Creative Writing American Studies and English Language that we have, uh, he's been a huge assistant in that. And then we move on to the, into the faculty itself. His research work has been massive for the faculty. His research exercise uh, 
contribution to the last research exercise was massive uh, in terms of impact, international impact. And so his contribution to the university has been huge. So to give someone a professorial title, there are many other steps uh, that uh, we have to be grateful for, for, his, for that kind of contribution. But I would also like to say something else as well, which is that on behalf of the department, the faculty, the university, I'd also like to thank his family. I'd like to thank Tracy and Alfie and Charlie, because nobody ever did this on their own. The support you get from family, you get from friends, you get from the people around you, all those times that you're thinking about Sherlock Holmes and your writing and, and, and stuff, that other things that you sacrificed. So what happened today is, is a combination of 20 years effort that other people have contributed to as well. So I thank you on behalf of the university. Thank you very much.